Good morning, Peace Tower Church family. Good morning, friends. Good morning, visitors. We are so glad that you joined us this morning. We're here to worship. We're here to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. This morning, we're going to celebrate communion together. So during worship, if you haven't already um, prepared your elements, please do that. Uh, we're going to come to the table of the Lord in the fullness of joy as we enter into his presence and receive all that he's given us today. Amen. This morning, let us just enter into his presence. Stir yourself up in your most holy spirit. Stir yourself up and worship the Lord in spirit and Amen. in truth. Amen. Come on, let's go, let's go. Jesus, we lift your name on high, your name on high, be lifted high. Jesus, we lift your name on high, your name on high, be lifted Jesus. Oh, Jesus, we lift your name on high, your name on high, be lifted 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 high, and all the earth be lifted high.
in your living room. This morning, can I hear a shout? <laughs> can you give the Lord a shout of praise this morning? He is mighty. He is fighting for you this morning. He is the great I am. There's nothing that you need that He can't provide, that He can't come through for. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. God of exceedingly. He's the God of abundantly, more than we ask or think. Lord, you will never fail. Your name is powerful. Your word's unstoppable. All things are possible in you. God of exceedingly, God of abundantly, more than we ask or think, Lord, you will never fail. Your name is powerful, your word's unstoppable. All things are possible in you. Make way through the waters, walk me through the fire. Do what you are famous for. What you are famous for, shut the mouths of lions, bring dry bones to life, and do what you are famous for, what you are famous for, oh God, I believe in you, God, I believe in you, 
Oh, God, I believe in you. Oh, God, I believe in you. God of exceedingly, God of abundantly, more than we ask or think. Lord, you will never fail. Your name is powerful. Your words unstoppable. All things are possible. be your confession this morning that you believe in him that the prayers you made this morning that the prayers you made last night that the prayers you made six months ago that you believe that God will bring it to pass <laughs> it might take some time more time than you would have hoped but may that be your confession this morning to believe to believe hang on hang on whatever you're believing for hang on this morning hallelujah God, I believe. The word says that without faith, we cannot please God. He wants us huh, to use our faith, to believe huh, that we, we can see something we haven't, and we haven't, we could see it in our, in our spirit, even before we see it in the natural. God, I believe. God, I believe in you. Oh God, I believe in you. Oh God, I believe in you. God, I believe in you. God of exceedingly, God of abundantly, more than we ask or think. Lord, you will never fail. Your name is powerful. Your word's unstoppable. All things are possible in you. All things, all things are possible in you. Come on, let's declare that. Oh, all things are possible in you. All things are possible in you, Jesus. All things are possible in you, God of exceedingly, God of abundance. More than we ask or think. We ask or think. Oh Lord, you will Lord, never, you fail. never fail. Your name is powerful. Your words unstoppable. All things are possible in you. All things are possible in you. All things are possible in you. Oh God, I believe. 
God, I believe in you. Lord, I believe in you. I believe in your word. I believe that you are not a man to lie. Hallelujah. I believe in you this morning. I trust in you this morning. We put our trust and hope in you, Lord. You are my anchor, the one we're holding on. The one we're holding on. Yes, yes. Oh, we believe, we believe. The Bible says, if you can only believe, if you can only believe, you will see great and mighty things. I'm going to encourage you this morning. Don't lose hope. Continue to believe in what you've prayed for. Yes. Continue to hold on to the promises of God. For He is not a man to lie. He will do what He say He will do. Uh -huh. For He is God. The God of Amen. Israel. The one who make the water. Who opened the Red Sea. The one who opened the road where there were no way. The one who is and is to come. Hallelujah. The great I am. Hold on to Him. Hold on to the truth. Hold on to the hope. And that hope is Jesus. We look on you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. We look Jesus. to you, Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> we fix our eyes on yes, you, Jesus. Lord. We fix our eyes no on one you. else we can look for but for you. Yes, Lord. Only you, God. <laughs> Only you, Jesus. Hey. Jesus. We believe. Yes, we believe, we believe, we believe, we believe. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. A holy moment in the, in the presence of our God this morning. He is, He is an amazing God. If you don't know Him yet, hallelujah. Open your heart to Him this morning. If you have not met personally with Jesus, Open your heart to Him this morning. Open the door to your heart this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. When we meet and we gather together, we always want to take time to worship our King, worship our Jesus for what He's done, for who He is. Prepare your heart to worship Him. Prepare your heart to worship Him this morning. Hallelujah. If you don't have any word to say, just say hallelujah. It's international. It's international language. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just begin to sing in your home. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Raise up your voice one more time and say hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord on my soul. It's a heavenly language. Hallelujah. Oh Jesus. We worship you this morning, Lord. Peace to our church family, agree with heaven and say, Hallelujah, Lord. We bless your name. Hallelujah. Yes, God. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. to be praised we humble ourselves this morning oh God we surrender ourselves to you this morning oh God Lift up holy hands before him.
come to the table of the Lord this morning. We're carrying our praise. We're carrying our worship. We're reclining in the presence of our Jesus. Here we are, gathered at the table of the Lord. Can you see it? Jesus said, come. Come all you who are weary. Come, all you who are heavy burdened, come, come and find rest. We're here in the midst of our Jesus, and nothing is impossible for him. We come this morning with worship, with thanksgiving. We come to bless the Lord. Psalm 103 tells us exactly what he's done for us. He's done it all and nothing's impossible. Nothing is impossible for the Lord and nothing is impossible for us with the Lord. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Even when we're downcast, even when we're downtrodden, even when we're full of joy and filled with the Spirit, We speak to our soul. We speak to our soul to worship the King of Kings. Who pardons all your iniquities. Who heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit. Who crowns you with love and kindness and compassion. Who satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. The Lord performs righteous deeds and judgments for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses and his acts to the sons of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. He will not always strive with us, nor will he always keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness towards those who fear him. Yes, it's a fear that is awe. It's awesome, God. We don't fear out of the, we don't fear out of the tactics of the enemy. We come before our holy God in fearsome awe. And he sets us free. So great is his loving kindness towards us, those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Just as the Father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he himself knows our frame, and he is mindful that we are just dust. As for man, his days are like grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourishes. 
When the wind has passed over it, it will be no more. And its place acknowledges it no longer. But the loving kindness of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. And his righteousness to his children's children. To those who keep his covenant and remember his precepts to do them. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his sovereignty rules over all. Bless the Lord, you his angels, mighty in strength who perform his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you his hosts, you who serve him, doing his will. Uh, Bless the Lord, all your works. Bless the Lord all you his works in all places of his dominion bless the lord O my soul today we bless the lord we come to the table we come to the table and we remember the lord's supper for i have received from the lord what i also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Partake of the bread. same way after supper he took the cup saying this is the cup is the new covenant in my blood do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes partake of the cup Father, we're so grateful. We're so grateful, Father, that we're here today in your presence. Father, we ask that you would make your word known to each heart that is listening. We ask you, God, this morning that you would pour out your spirit once again, the spirit of truth, the spirit of revelation, and the spirit of understanding. And Father, if there's any in our midst that have not met you through your son, Jesus, today, Father, we bless them to come into the kingdom to come into the kingdom for such a time as this. You are called by name. You are loved by a holy God. And all your sins, all your iniquities, uh as they pass through the blood, are forgiven and forgotten. Today, Father, we just thank you to be in your midst. uh And we give you all the glory. Thank you, Jesus. The blood has not lost its power. Remember that. The blood and the word has not lost its power. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. It will never lose its power. Thank you, Lord. Aren't we just in that place of peace and love and joy? Aren't we just in that place of thanksgiving? So we just come with that thanksgiving today, with our offerings, with our tithes, with our gifts. I just want to remind you of the ways you can give. It's going to be on the screen, but I just want to remind you that when you do e-transfer, please remember to designate if it's your tithe, if it's your offering, if it's your... Uh, st- storehouse gift or if it's for the renovations gift would you please just remember to do that on your e-transfer 
And if you don't feel to do it by e-transfer, then I would uh, just invite you to come on down to the church because we have on Bronson Street uh, a door that has a very secure <laughs> mailbox and it's checked almost every day and it will be safe there. So we just bless you now to come and bring your tithes and bring your offerings. Amen. Our church. Oh, We're good morning. Here. Hi. <laughs> sorry. sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. We're here on the top of the roof. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, on the ceiling of Peace Tower Church. Yes. We are removing nails removing from the, nails. the pillars here, as Pastor Solomon and Alicia are showing. And this is going to save us uh, seven thousand dollars in uh, in construction fees. So we're really happy about this. Yeah, and um, I just want to let you guys know that we're back with Kids Ministry every Sunday at 9 a.m. Um, well, you'll get to see my face, so of course I should see you there um, on YouTube and Facebook at 9 a.m. Make sure the whole family is there tuning in right before service. Yes, and also for the next announcement, we have prayer again at 6.30 p.m. on Saturdays and 7 a.m. 6 a.m.? Six a.m. <laughs> Six a.m. on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Yes, and also Saturday nights. Six thirty, we have worship prayer. Come seek the Lord, Hallelujah. So enjoy the service, and um, I can't wait until we're all back here. And well, our marks are on this building because we're here pulling the nails out. Praise the Lord, Amen. Bye, everyone. Have a nice. I don't know. <laughs> Well, let's get back to work. Okay. Enjoy the, the preaching. Bye. <laughs> With my get to work. Hammer. The little hammer. <laughs> I'm working. Where are the nails? How do you feel? Oh, it's a video. Yeah. Oh, you know, we feel good. We're all the way up doing okay. things closer to Jesus this way, you know? Yeah, here's yeah. literally the roof. <laughs> Come on, wasn't that an amazing, amazing display of God's goodness? Our students are here, they're working hard, and I just want to tell you, they bring joy to the house. Um, there's just a couple of more things I'd like to remind you of. Father's Day is coming up. Uh, it's going to be a great day in the house because uh, Graham Gunn is going to be our uh, message bringer, full of the Holy Spirit, declaring goodness. Uh, to the fathers and the men in the house. And guess what, men? You have not been left out. We have been thinking about you, and we're putting together a gift. Uh, well, actually, three gifts. The three gifts, um, but you need to enter the draw. You need to put your name. You need to register. I know, and don't you dare get your wife to do it or one of your kids. You do it yourself. Come on. Come on up to that next level. <laughs> anyway, I just want to say we are so grateful um, that Father's Day is coming and that we're going to be able to celebrate all the fathers and the men in the house. Get your registration in, and um, yeah, we can't wait to see who gets the, uh, gets the prizes. Anyway, the other thing is just one more thing I have to tell you about the opening, the reopening. Come on, is everybody happy about this? Oh, I'm really sorry. 
I'm really sorry, but we don't know when we're opening. <laughs> but you know what? I have a challenge for you. I have a challenge that we could pray it open. You know what? We should pray the doors open. Let's do it, okay? Anybody with me? Come on, come on. Well, we're at that time we've been waiting for. Uh, Pastor Sonaz is bringing us a message today, and we're just going to um, welcome her here. Come on, Pastor Sonaz, bring it on down. Good morning. Thank you for the, um, the welcome. So kind of going back to the construction and being on the, on the roof, it was fun. It was a hot day after we had lunch. It was just one of those days where it was fine in the morning, but in the afternoon it was a little slower, at least for me. That's when I started complaining. It was too hot. I'm too tired. My arms are sore. But you know what? It was a good opportunity, and I think I, think I may have gotten over my fear of height. I think. I'm not sure. Because the very first time climbing up the ladder, it was really hard. It was just like, you know, climbing. And the, the hardest part is looking down and you can see where you are. That made it harder. Now, going up, I found was easier. Coming down, I was struggling. I was going around trying to find a way to get down. I was sitting. I was crawling. I was, it was hard. And I, I think the last day there was a, a worker there who... I don't know how they do it, but he just skipped the ladder, jumped down, and here I am struggling going down, and he's staring at me. Well, so there's him, and then there's Alicia, both staring at me while I'm trying to find a way to go down. And this is what I said to them. Stop staring at me, because if you stare at me, I'm going to stay here all day, and I will not go down. So I finally made it down, and yeah, I think I still have the fear, but it's a little, it's better now, because you know, just climbing up and climbing down. Um, it was fun doing it, and I think we, I can say for all of us, <laughs> I don't know, but I think it was, it was good to be up there to do a little bit of a manual work to, to kind of feel how it is. I mean, Mr. Bob is there every day doing all the work, you know, bringing a giant fan down. I don't know how he does it while bringing it down, climbing down. He's a trooper, but sometimes it's good for us to experience some of the things we never do. So I think I, I can speak for all of us. I had a good day. Um, second day was a little better. So thank you for helping out. Those of you who helped us, we really do appreciate it. So this morning, I want us to go back to the beginning, the very, very beginning where it all started, Genesis. Genesis, the greatest story that was ever told, and it was not our story. It was God's own story. And it's not just another story of, you know, humankind's us searching for God, but it was a story that God was searching for humanity. You know, it's amazing to me that it's only the faith, Christianity, that God is searching for people. You know, when you look at all the other religions, it's man searching after God, but not Christianity. Christianity is God looking for us, searching for us. That's what the Bible, te- that's what the Bible teaches us. It, you know, it's, it highlights an essential difference between our Christian faith and other religions. Well, you know what, our Christian faith and religions in the world, you know, because what we have is a relationship. It's not a religion. If you didn't know, now you know. What we have is a relationship with our Father not a religion. So since this is God's story, Genesis, so since God is telling us this story, he's writing this story, it doesn't start like all the other stories with a hidden God, you know, people trying to find him. No, it actually starts with God, the creator of all that is. It tells us that in the beginning, God, that God is before all things, that he is the cause of all things, that he is therefore above all things, which means that he is the goal of all things. And then we're told that humanity is the crowning glory of the creator's work. That's what we are. We're made in God's own likeness, with whom he could communicate and with whom he actually delights. He delights in us. If you didn't know that, he delights in you. 
We were created to know the absolute pleasure of his presence, his love, and his favor. Wow. And so since we were created in God's image, we were enjoying, you know, we, we get to enjoy his vision. We get to experience his love. But here's the thing. We were created to be dependent on God. For life and for even existing. So remember that. We were created to be dependent. But something, something changed in Genesis 3. And when that happened in Genesis 3, it ran through all the way to Revelation 22. Well, yeah, even now. That changed. So this chapter tells us that men and women craved God-likeness. And that in that very moment, they chose independence over depending on God. They thought they could do it. They thought they could survive. But they didn't. And so the result of that, as we know, it was the fall. A very, very tragic fall. So it all started in the Garden of Eden where God asked man the very first question. Where are you? The first question God asked Adam and Eve were, they ate the very first food that God literally told them, don't touch it, don't even look at it, don't eat it. Because when you look at it, you'll get tempted. So they looked at it, then they got tempted, then they ate it. The very first question, where are you? Garden, Garden of Eden was their home, their paradise, their place of comfort where they knew no sin. They were in a relationship with the creator. They walked with him. They talked with him. A place that they could spend all eternity with God, a life spent intimately and intentionally with their creator. They were dependent on the creator. They're forever home, but not after they messed up. After they messed up, they were kicked out for good. And God made sure that they will never return on their own term. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to read Genesis 6, or sorry, verse, chapter 3, verses 6 to 13. It says, the woman saw that the tree's fruit was good to eat and pleasing to look at. Have you noticed when sometimes you look at something you're not supposed to be looking at? First day you look at it, you're like, oh. Second day you're like, oh, I don't want to look at it, but I keep looking at it. Third day you end up touching it, right? Things that you're not supposed to do. So looking, be careful with what you look at. If, you know, are you supposed to be looking at it? Because you know eventually after staring for way too long, you become a person who you have to touch it and feel. And that's what happened with Adam and Eve. The fruit was good to eat and pleasing to look at. She also saw, saw that it would make a person wise. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then both of them knew things they had never known before. They realized they were naked. So they sewed fig trees, fig leaves and made clothes for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking in the garden. It was during the coolest time of the day. They hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. <laughs> they thought they can actually hide from him. But the Lord God called out to the man, Where are you? He asked. Well, I heard you in the garden, the man answered. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. The Lord God said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the fruit that I told you? I commanded you not to eat from. The man said, It's the fault of the woman you put here with me. She gave me some fruit. And so I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what have you done? I feel like God at this point was so disappointed. The question, what have you done? The woman said, the serpent tricked me. That's why I ate the fruit. You know, if we take this account seriously, which I think we should, we notice that God did this on a regular basis, came down, walked with them, visited them, had a conversation with them, prayed with them. That's how it was. But for now, Adam and Eve, in their guilt and awareness of their nakedness, the best thing they could do was hide from their creator. It's like they heard it. Oh, crap, he's here. Hide! They heard the footsteps in the garden, and so they hid. This indicated a routine action on God's part. He came in the cool of the day, not because it was pleasing for him. No, because it was pleasing for men. 
he regularly held some form of communication with men. That's how the relationship was made between man and God. Because God intended it to be that way. So the question he asked was, where are you? Notice the importance of the questions. The question, where are you? You know, when people are lost, the first, the very first question they ask themselves, where am I? You know, suppose you get a phone call right now, and the person who's calling you says, listen, I was about to come over to your house, but somehow I got lost, and I don't know where I'm going. My GPS is lying to me. Can you help me? What is the first question you're going to ask? Where are you? Because you don't know where they are. They just called you panicked. So you ask, where are you? But not God. See, God knows. And he knew where Adam was. He knew where Eve was. He knew which bush they were hiding in. And he knew which, you know, they, were, they made clothes with the fig leaves. He knew that already. So you think, you know, you look at Adam and you think about him. And you're like, Adam, you really? Did you actually really think you could hide from God? You know, he knows everything. He knew what you were going to do. He knew you were going to eat that fruit. And he knew you were going to blame your wife. And he knew your wife was going to blame the serpent. So you think you can hide your guilt, your shame, the sin from God by hiding in the bushes? you got to think again. Because God knew. He knew exactly what's going to happen. He knew why they were hiding. You see, when God asked Adam... Hey, Adam, where are you? He wasn't playing hide-and-go-seek with them. He wasn't asking a question because he was dumb and he didn't know. You know, he saw it. He knew what they were going to do. He asked the question because he wanted to bring them to the place of obedience. He asked the question because he knew exactly what they had done. He wanted them to own up and say, well, I ate the fruit. I did it. I know you said don't eat it, but I was tempted. She tempted me. I had to eat it. It looked so good. So he asked the question, where are you? Not because he didn't know, but because he wanted to give them an opportunity to own up to their disobedience. First, by asking Adam, where are you? This This is what I think happened. When God asked Adam, where are you? Why he was in the bushes. He's like, oh, crap. He was probably thinking, oh, no. You know what? He knows what I've done. And you know what? I messed up. Now, my relationship with God is forever disconnected. My midday walk, my midday prayer, my midday, my mentor, he's gone. It's disconnected. I no longer have that relationship with him. My relationship with him is disconnected. And secondly, nothing you didn't know this, nothing is ever hidden from God's sight. God, in his omniscience, knew exactly where Adam was hiding, why he was hiding, and why he was hiding, and where, and who he was hiding from, but the reason why he was hiding. Proverbs 15, 3 says, the eyes of the Lord are everywhere. They watch those who are evil and those who are good by, those who are good. And so by asking Adam, where are you? God was bringing Adam to a place of accountability. Adam is forced to confess that he's hiding from God because he deliberately disobeyed God's commandment. So he did what any sinner would do, hide in the bushes and pretend he never sinned. He didn't do it. See, when I was younger, I thought my mom had eyes behind her her head. A set of new eyes behind her head. Because every time she'd say, I know what you did. But she wasn't with me. How did she know what I did? So I believed it for the longest time. Every time she said, I have eyes everywhere. Especially I have eyes in the back of my head. You think you're there? I can watch everything you're doing. And I believed it for the longest time. I used to think it was true because She never missed anything. I think that's what I'm going to use on my kids because I knew she didn't know anything, but she pretended she knew so that I could confess to what I did. She wanted me to own up to what I did. And that's what God, God knew. God knew exactly what they did. So there were three other questions that God asked plus the one question, where are you? 
And so we're going to look at that. So question number one, we know God asked, where are you? And he would respond, well, I heard you in the garden. The man answered, I was afraid, so I hid. I was naked, so I hid. Second and third question, the Lord God said, who told you you were naked? The, third, the fourth question is, then the Lord God said to the, to the woman, what, I think at this point he was very disappointed. What have you done? You were supposed to be the helper, not the one who tricks people. You know, that's what he was probably thinking. You are the helper of the man, not to trick the man. Then she said, well, the serpent tricked me and so I ate it. Blame the, blame the serpent, blame, blame the devil. You know, when in doubt, blame him. So, you know, I want to ask a question from those of you who are parents. You know, you walk into the room and you catch your child in act. And you look them in the eyes and you're like, what are you doing? It's not because you don't know what they're doing. You can clearly see that they've drawn on the wall with the crayons, you know, stick men and all the fun little trees. You don't ask them. Any, any genius would know they have messed up your wall. So you're not asking the question because you want to know. You don't know what they're doing and you want to know what they're doing. You're asking the question because you want to hear from them what they're doing. Oh, uh, I got bored and I was painting your wall. You know, you want to hear them, and you want them to own up so you can punish accordingly, right? That's what you do as parents. Usually we don't ask questions to draw information. We ask questions to prompt the individual to own up to what they have just done. And then you provoke them to, to make an attempt to resolve the matter, whether it's an apology or punishment for five years in your room, I don't know. But you make that attempt. You make them realize what they have. Maybe not five years, but maybe five months. So God asked not one, but four questions to which he already knew the answer. Why? Because he wanted to bring them to the place of accountability. So today, none of us can be saved from God's wrath. Not you, not me, not the worship team, not Pastor David, nobody. Until you come to the point where Adam did. It's not until we realize that we are dead in sin, hiding in our, in our bushes, that salvation can be received. So how often do you ask yourself the question, where am I? Where am I in my walk with God and my faith in my journey where are you are you in Christ have you trusted the Lord Jesus Christ his death his burial his resurrection have you trusted that he died for your sin and that your sin is paid for or are you like Adam hiding from God to do to the broken fellowship where are you you know, in our small, ignorant little head, we think no matter what we do, we can hide it from God. We can outsmart him, and if we do something wrong, we can run away and hide in the bushes. Adam and Eve tried that, and it didn't work. You see, sometimes our life or in our circumstances, we can withdraw from God because there was something that happened, and it just makes sense to stay away from God. We don't want, like, you know, eating that fruit in the fall. Withdrawing from God is sometimes easier than owning up and admitting, oh, I'm a sinner. I did it. I messed up. I mean, how many of you think it's hard to apologize just to someone? You've done them wrong. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry for doing that. I used, to, I used to have a really hard time apologizing and owning up to my mistake. This was way, way before. Not now. Way before but it's hard to apologize. It's easier to hide and run than to admit that you've done something wrong. But here's the reality of walking with God. You can hide in the deepest and the darkest hole you can find. But when, once you are outside of his will, he will come and he will find you. He knows where you are. Because once you've stepped out, of his will, he will find you. You know why? Because he wants to bring you to the place of accountability. 
He loves you so much that he doesn't want to see you go far. He wants you to have room to come back, to admit it, I messed up, I'm a, I want to come back. Because he's our creator and we were not meant to do life without him. We were meant to depend on him. And the moment Adam and Eve were thrown out of the garden, misery started following them. Pain, agony, life itself was running after them. So now, Adam and Eve were on their own trying to figure out life. And it's not like God left them. No, he didn't leave them. They decided to live a life apart from God, an independent life. But God was still there. They chose a life without God. So how do you respond when God asks, where are you? Can you respond honestly real, realizing that there needs to be a, a change on your end? Can you truly answer that? You know, perhaps many of you will say, well, I, I don't know where I am. I, I'm not sure where I'm going. I know I'm not in his will. I know I haven't walked with him for such a long time. So I, I'm not sure where I am. And that's okay. That's good. At least you're admitting the truth. You don't know where you are. You need God. I need to be back to walk with him. But what are you going to do to change that? You don't know where you are. That's okay. What are you going to do to change that? Perhaps many of us can't help, e can't help because, you know, we or we can't be helped because we think or we don't know where we are. And we don't want to admit that we're lost, so we just lie about it. Maybe that's where you are. Where are you? How is your relationship with God? You see, Adam and Eve's relationship with their creator was forever broken. Well, changed. Because they chose a life apart from God. It wasn't broken. It was changed. But in a way, their fellowship was broken. It wasn't the same anymore. So their actions separated them from the Father, where from their creator. So they were separated. The relationship was broken. So what is the one thing in your life that has separated you from the Father? What is the one thing that's causing you to, to not close up that fellowship, not to come close to him? What is that one thing? I want to leave you with something encouraging, though. Yes, Adam and Eve messed up. And yes, you and I mess up every day. I mess up. I am a mess up. I mess up every day. I'm not perfect. No, and just because I'm a pastor, I am far beyond perfect. And I'm admitting it. I mess up a lot. But God is full of grace. He is full of grace. You see, you and I will give up on people and we'll just dismiss them. <laughs> So-and-so is just so hopeless. There's no life. They can't do anything. I've done it before. But God, he doesn't do it that way. You see, even if you fall out of a relationship with him, he still pursues you. He still runs after you. He will still pursue you no matter what because we were desired to have a relationship with him. There's so many of us who are running away from him. A lot of us who are running away from him. But guess what? He is still, he's running after you because he wants a relationship with you. He will not leave you orphans and will always pursue you. Now, I don't know about you, but I want to serve a God who pursues me, who comes after me, who runs after me, who wants to be my father, have a relationship with me. Not a God who sits up there and says, hmm, you're doomed. Don't talk to me. You can't have a relationship with me. That's not the kind of God I want to serve. You see, when my dad was searching for, that, for, for God who, can, who he can have a relationship with, you know, he read the Quran, and he was like, no. And then he read the Bible, and everything just started making sense for him. Because the God of the Bible wanted a relationship with him. The God of the Bible pursued him way before he even started reading the Bible. But not the God of the Quran. The God of the Quran was just sitting, you know, he was just in a box, left up there. You can't even think about having a relationship with the God of Quran, a relationship. You cannot even say his name because his name is so holy. But not the God of the Bible. 
The God of the Bible pursues you. He wants a relationship with you. He wants you to know who he is. I want to serve a God who calls me by name. You see, the God of the Bible pursued my dad. He called him out of religion into a relationship. Out of slavery and shackles into freedom and life. A brand new life. Worship team, I'm going to ask you to come up. You see, God came to Adam and Eve. He gave them us. He gave them and he gave us a second chance. You know, just because they were kicked out of their forever home, their place of comfort, didn't mean that God abandoned them. No, that's not the God of the Bible. That's the God of other religions, but not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible still cared and still loved them and still wanted them to pursue him and him pursue them. Because that is the kind of God we serve. Our relationship was restored back because of Jesus. So here's the question I ask you again. Where are you in your relationship with God? Where are you? Just generally, where are you? Are you in a, are you in a relationship with God? Do you call him your, you know your his, do you call him your father? Do you believe in Jesus' death, his resurrection? Do you believe that he died for you? Where are you in your life? Are you just, have you given up? Or maybe you're saying it's been a while since, you know, I used to have a relationship with God, but then life happened and I just kind of withdrew away from him like Adam and Eve. So this morning, I want to pray for you. You see, I believe the question, where are you? I, I had written this sentence where are you in my journal a few months ago and I thought to myself this would be a great sermon where are you because so many of us are searching for God and we're asking God where are you but the thing is God is already there he's asking you where are you so I want to pray for you this morning knowing that I don't know where you are I don't know who's watching us online there may be some of you who um, have never heard of the God of the Bible. Some of you maybe, you know, lost your relationship or maybe in a relationship, but you're just dry. So I want to pray with you. And I want to encourage you. And I want to let you know that no matter how far you run, no matter how deep your hole is where you hide, or maybe you hide in the bushes from God, I want to let you know that you cannot run from him because you were not created to do life without God. You were created to be dependent on God. So Lord, Father, we thank you that we are not left alone on our own, God. Lord, we thank you that you never gave up on us even though the fall happened. You still picked us up, God. You still gave us a chance, Lord, to come to know you, Lord. Father, we're so grateful that we don't serve a God who's hiding in the bushes, but who is just, who appears to us wherever and whenever, Lord God. We can reach out to you, Lord God, whenever and wherever we want, Lord God. Lord, we thank you that you hear our prayers. We thank you that you are God over all. Lord, we thank you that you are our Father. You are Abba. And that you have called us out of slavery, Lord. Out of shackles and bondage into life. Abundant life, Lord God. So, Father, this morning I pray for those who are watching us. For those who are dry in their call and they're in their faith with you. For those who have maybe not even a relationship with you right now. I call on you, God, and I ask that, Lord, you make a way for them. If that's you this morning, if you're saying, I don't have a relationship with God, but I want to follow him. I want a relationship with him. I know that he died for me. I know that he removed every sin and imperfection that I have. So I want to give my life to Jesus. Then I want to encourage you to pray with me. To agree with me in prayer. 
that Jesus has died for your sin, for my sin. And this morning, you are set free by Jesus' blood. So, Father, we are so grateful that we get to stand here, that we get to worship the the God of the universe, God, the God who was from the beginning was there, the God who created everything, the God who calls us by name. Father, would you pour out your love to those who need you this morning, who are watching and who are saying, I want a relationship with you. Father, would you just meet with them right now, God? Would you touch their hearts right now, God? Here's what I want you to do. If you're the one that says, I have never accepted Jesus in my life, but I want to walk with them this morning, I want you to repeat this prayer. Everybody can repeat this prayer even if you've received, but this is mainly for you. If you haven't received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want you to repeat after me. Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, but God, I believe that you died for me, Jesus. And so today, I want to follow you as my Lord and my Savior. I want you to live in my heart and lead my life from this day forward. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You were singing over me. You've been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You've been so, so kind.
love coming after me Cause no wall you won't tear down No you won't tear down Coming after me There's no shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up Coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down No you won't tear down Coming after me